So we saw how the central limit theorem played out if the distribution was skewed or non-symmetric. But what if it is a symmetric distribution? What if it's a normal distribution to begin with? Then what happens? That's a perfectly reasonable question to ask. All right, so we have here a population distribution that is normal, right? That's a normal distribution at the start. And we take sample sizes for uh, three sampling distributions. So we're going to draw samples from this population that are size 2, 10, and 20. And we want to figure out which one is which. Which graph is 10, which graph is 20, and which graph is 2. Hmm. All right, so one thing we learned is that the spread shrinks, right? So we know that the spread, I want to think about it this way. Let me label these, actually. Um, if I say this is the population up here, which it is, one of these has to be a graph with n equals 10, one of it has to be n equals 20, and one has to be n equals 2. I keep forgetting that one. All right, so if I want to go from spread from least, so least spread, Um, and then I can do middle spread, say which one's the middle spread out. <laughs> That's a word, middle spread. And then the most spread, the largest spread, greatest spread. What will we see? Okay, the one that's the least spread out is this one right here. You can see that little bit, and even if you didn't have it, that is pretty tightly packed, more tightly packed than the other two. And this one is kind of the middle spread, and this one's the most spread right here. So the least spread would actually be graph A, the middle spread would be graph C, and the largest spread would be graph B. All right, now how does that translate into standard error and thinking about it that way? And would that help us? Okay, so Letter B would be the largest spread. The largest spread has the smallest um, sample size. Remember that spread is sigma sub x bar or SE of x bar, either way. SE is kind of a more modern way to write it. And of course the formula for it is sigma over the square root of n. So because n is in the denominator, then the largest spread would have the smallest n. So this is going to be the one with n equals 2. This is going to be the one with n equals 20 over here, and n equals 10, which we could guess was going to be in the middle. If we were asked to find that spread, we could actually do it, because this would be, um, if we wanted to know sigma sub x bar, this one would be 5 over the square root of 20. This one would be 5 over the square root of 10. And this would be 5 over the square root of 2. Now, where am I getting the 5 from? Because it told me at the start <laughs> that sigma was 5. So this particular graph has a give or take of 5. Right? You can see those are 5 away from that middle line, whereas this one is very, very small. How small? Well, I could grab a calculator and find that out. So if I say 5 divide square root 2, there we go. That's 3.55, right? So this one right here would be 3.5, oh, 3.54, sorry. I'm going to move this over so you can see. And then if I take 5 divide square root of 10, this would be 1.58. And if I say 5 divided by the square root, I chose to go and retype it every time this time for no particular reason. All right, so this is 1.12. There we have it. And you can see I was right, right? In case you didn't get it instinctively, then you can do the calculation and figure it out. The one with the largest spread is the one with the smallest sample size. So this one right here has to be n equals 2, right? n equals 2 right, because it has the largest spread, it's the most spread out of the graphs, other than the population itself, which would be sort of like n equals 1. This one's the most packed in, the most compact, so this is n equals 20 right here, because it has the least spread, so that would be n equals 20. And the middle amount of spread, which we could have guessed because it's the middle number, is n equals 10, so that's not difficult. So n equals 10 is right here, and you can see the numbers are backing us up. 
3.54 is much larger than 1.12. And you can see it right here, it's a give or take of about three and a half, whereas this one's give or take of about one. All right, so we've answered the one question because it wanted us to label which one was n equals two, which one was n equals 10, which one was n equals 20. And we can see that is um, how to do that based on what we know from the central limit theorem. Now, it didn't specifically ask us for that, but I might as well mention right now, the center for all of them is the same number. <laughs> so the center up here is mu, which is 16. That's that little line right there. And right here, it's the mean of the x bars, but it's also 16 because these are not graphs of the population. These are graphs of averages of samples. It's a little weird to get your mind around. Take a sample to find the average of that sample, the mean, the x bar, and then plot it. Take a sample, find the x bar, plot it, and so on. So these are graphs of the x bars of samples, samples of size 20, samples of size 2, and samples of size 10. The larger the sample, the smaller the spread. So that's why this one's the smallest. But the centers never change. The center is 16 all the way down. You can see the graphs line up, right? So the center is the mean of the x bars, which is the mean, which is 16 for all n, right? No matter what your size of n is, the center is the same number, always. So that's nice. And we did spread, we did center. We actually used spread to answer their question. They didn't specifically ask about the center, but I figured we might as well throw it in for good measure. So we used the spread to figure out which graph was which. And now there's one other piece that we want to talk about, which is the shape, because it asks us, what do we notice about their shapes? And the answer is, they're all normal. The population was normal, n equals 2 is normal, n equals 20 is normal, every single one of these is normal. That was not the case in the previous example when it was skewed. So when we want to look at the shapes, we want to notice every graph is normal, regardless of n. Interesting. So what does that mean? So that means that if the population distribution, which I'm going to abbreviate population distribution, which is the kind of gray one up here, if that population distribution is normal, normally shaped, normal, or normally distributed, I should say, then all the sampling distributions, all the sampling distributions, all the x-bar distributions, which is what we're looking at, are normal. Even if n is less than 30, regardless of n. Um, in other words, even if n is small, right? even if it's less than 30, doesn't matter. Every single one of these was normal because the population was normal. And this leads us to the center limit theorem because we've just shown all the important parts. <laughs> well, not all of them. We have a couple more to go. There it is. Okay. So... If we have a population of size n with a mean mu, right, we've been seeing those means right there, and a standard deviation sigma, and that's for the population, those are the kind of charcoal gray graphs at the top. And then you take a sample of size n selected from that population, provided some conditions that we kind of implied, but we'll, we'll talk about them. We want it to be random, obviously, because we really can't do anything in this class unless it's random, independent. And then we want it to work out to be normal. Now, I'll, I'll go back to the random independent in one second, but look at the normal piece. It says either the population is normal to begin with, right? And you can tell that from a graph. So we saw that in example two. In example two, this population is normal. So if its population is normal, then any sample you grab, any sampling distribution you grab is normal. Or the sample size is large. So either you want it to be normal to begin with, or you want n greater than or equal to 30. You want one of those two qualities. This one was example two, and this one was example one. If we have those that condition along with random and independent, which let's talk about those right now. Random, random is very important. As I mentioned, we don't do anything in this class unless it's random because otherwise we would have bias, right? So randomness protects against bias. 
and bias is a very bad thing, as we've learned. In chapter one. And bias is bad. We really do not have a way to deal with bias, especially in a beginning class like this. But even in graduate school, um, I will tell you, bias is still very, very, very difficult to deal with. If, if you can deal with it at all, which a lot of times you cannot. So randomness protects against that bias. Now independence, let's look at this for just a second. You want your sample observations to be independent of the population. If the sample is collected without replacement, then the population must be at least 20 times larger than the sample size. All right. So notice it's saying without replacement, meaning we learned in chapter five, if you sample without replacement, that's not independent. That's dependent. What's going on here? Well, what they're saying is, look, yeah, yeah, yeah. If I sample without replacement, technically that's dependent. But as long as I take a really small sample, <laughs> Right? As long as my sample is less than 5% of my population, then it's close enough. Right? It's good enough. I can, I can do it. So I want my sample size to be less than 5% of my population size. So we want our sample size to be large, but not too large. Right? So think about what this is saying. This part right here is saying you want it to be larger than 30, so you can ensure normal. But this part's saying, yeah, but not too big, because if you get too big, you're going to lose independence. Right, because technically this is dependent, but the problem is its dependency is so small, nobody's going to matter or nobody's going to care. So we're kind of faking independence. It's not really independent. <laughs> when you're sampling without replacement, it's not independent, which is what we are doing most of the time. We're sampling without replacement, but we're faking it. <laughs> right. So what? How are we doing this? Well, um, you want your sample size. to be um, so small that it does not affect the population. So let me give you a couple examples. <laughs> One's a little bit more fun than the other. Uh, when I take my dog to a pet store, <laughs> they put those bins where the dog kibble is um, at a low, or not the dog, the dog treats. And so I, one time I was sitting there looking at dog shampoos and I, I felt this gentle tug and I looked over and my dog was very delicately just taking one little bone out of the, the bin <laughs> because she's like, oh, you know, if I take a small enough amount, no one's going to know the difference, right? Every kid who steals candy from a store thinks this. Like if I just take, you know, one, little you know m and m nobody's gonna know exactly you're assuming that your sample size is so small that nobody's gonna know the difference um and i know that seems like a facetious or facetious example it's not um there was actually a college in michigan that used to try to do polling of their local community it was part of a community college's stats program as a matter of fact and they had to stop after several years because what happened was um, they lost independence. They were sampling on calling the people in the community and it started to get out. Oh, they're calling. You better be home this week to answer their questions. And, and they started like people started lobbying. You know, you tell the college this, you tell the students that, et cetera, because the board would listen to the um, what the residents had to say. So it ended up getting political. It ended up getting to be a mess. They lost independence because they got larger than 5% of the local area being called um, by doing it year after year after year and so they actually had to stop the program right so it seems like oh that could never happen it actually happened at a um, college near me all right now the other the other thing to notice is that if you're sampling with replacements if if you always put everybody's phone number back in the bin say you're doing it you know like a phone poll or something like that then that's automatically independent right that's independent no matter what if you sample with replacement you're good it's if you sample without replacement, you have to be less than 5% of the population. You have to be small enough that nobody will notice you're calling, right? Now, if you have those three things, if you have those conditions of random, independent, and normal, and independent is kind of faking it most of the time. Most of the time, we just want to kind of fake our way through it, that N is less than 5% of capital N, the population size. So if we have those three things, then we know that the shape will be normal. The center will just be the center every time. 
And the standard error will be that formula that we learned, which is sigma over the square root of n. And again, sometimes in later chapters, we have to fake it with s over the square root of n. There's an approximation there. But the center will just be the center all the way down. The spread will change. And we note here, the larger the n, the smaller the spread. And that's what we saw in those in example one and example two. Right, so example one and example two were illustrating these things to us. The shape will be normal, the center will be the same, and the spread will shrink the larger the n is. And those two examples assumed that we had random and independent and normal happened one way or another. If we let our sample size get large enough, or if it was normal to begin with, and then all of the sampling distributions were normal.